Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Ibrahim Sani. We're going to look at the National Energy Transition Roadmap, which has been announced very recently. This is in conjunction with the Madani Economy announcement that uh, the Prime Minister has announced a few weeks ago as well. As we explore these kind of roadmaps and plans, we want to understand better the impact of the policies that is going to be executed by this current unity government. Joining us online is Anand Padmakantan, the Regional Equities Head of Maybank Investment. Thanks again for taking the time to speak with us, Anand. Let's do a quick recap in terms of yet another uh, roadmap that the government is introducing, the National Energy Transition Roadmap. What's, what is this all about? Is this the kind of energy policy that the last time you came on the show that you were craving for? Does this solve that particular craving? It definitely goes a long way, I think, uh, to you know, answer a lot of questions about what the energy transition roadmap for Malaysia will look like. I think we have to rewind a little bit. There was a lot of preamble uh, before this policy was announced in terms of announced, uh, you know, policy changes by the government. I think a big one was the lifting of the ban on RE exports. You know, that really set the tone that the government is looking at monetization avenues for our advantages in renewable energy production. And I think that was a very smart move. Uh, the other is, you know, really throwing down the gauntlet in terms of setting very high targets for RE capacity in Malaysia. So I think the the older target was, you know, uh, forty percent uh, plant up of total capacity by twenty thirty five. Now it's seventy percent uh, by twenty fifty, and the investment numbers are quite mind boggling. Over six hundred billion ringgit is required to get us there. So definitely a very ambitious plan, uh, and something that I think has got uh, investors quite excited. Uh, this is all in part to get uh, Malaysia's commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Do you feel that this roadmap actually points to that direction? Well, I think it's one piece of the puzzle. There are many other parts that we need to get right. A big one is our mobility uh, transition to EVs. So, you know, that is a big polluter as well for Malaysia in terms of carbon, especially when you consider we still have subsidies for petrol in place. So, we really need to solve that part of the equation as well. But in terms of the energy mix question mark, uh, the NETR does go a long way to answer the questions of where our priorities will be, how fast we will move, uh, and how much money we're willing to commit uh, to this journey to achieve that 2050 target. And then of course, uh, very recently we've seen how the overages of EV is making waves. Uh, some of the manufacturers are announcing some new models. I'm not just talking about Tesla. BYD has announced um, a mid-market model at about 100,000 ringgit, for instance. Uh, the take-up is also quite interesting. Uh, a lot of people are now ending that whole argument of which one comes first, the EV first or the infra first. Seems like people are now just getting the EV first, the infra can come later. That's the market reaction. Um, adoption, do you feel that we're no longer part of that early uh, adopter? We're now moving on to early majority instead? Well, I think we're still very early in the journey. Uh, when you look at the statistics, uh, you know, global EV sales are now 14% of total sales. That's the global average. For ASEAN, the average is 2.1%. Yeah, we're extremely low. And, you know, that's a number that's even lower than India, which is 2.3%. So we have a lot of work to catch up with global averages. So what we're doing now, I mean, a big reason we've, we've sort of been behind is precisely what you mentioned, lack of affordable models. So the green premium, which is the extra you have to pay for an for a EV over a comparable uh, ICE vehicle, has been too high for too long. So very good news, BYD is, is uh, introducing more affordable EV cars into the market. I think a, a real game changer is if we can have local assembly of EV especially the battery packs that go into EVs, because batteries are the biggest cost component of EVs. Yeah, 40 to 50% of the car is the battery. Yep. So if you can have battery assembly in Malaysia, it really makes the potential for a true mass market EV uh, that much more viable. Uh, I saw the uh, NETER uh, and I've been reading it over the past weekend. Um, it does not talk about uh, the end-to-end -end cyclical uh, supply chain model uh, that you highlighted, for instance, e uh, battery manufacturing uh, at length. Uh, is that uh, intentional? Because roadmaps tend to be long uh, horizon, so maybe such nitty-gritty items might not necessarily be uh, 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 smart to be put inside. But does this actually address that whole supply chain model where you look at battery, you look at manufacturing and many others? Is this roadmap for that? No, I think that will probably be more articulated in the upcoming National Industrial Master Plan that is to be announced by the end of this month, where, you know, uh, we want to increase the complexity of the economy for 
more value add and higher paying jobs. So I think that will be really articulated in that document. I think the NETR is much more focused on the, on the overall energy transition. So green mobility is actually mentioned as one of the 10 flagship projects in the NETR. Yep. But it is not the primary focus, I would say. Uh, I mean, when, when you look at the, the, the details, it talks a lot about setting up charging infrastructure, but nothing about you know, uh, EV upfront costs or, or, or dealing with that issue. That's really left for other policy uh, roadmaps down the road. But you know, the, uh, the NETR primary focus is to increase the RE generation in the country. And also, uh, as, uh, as two additional growth drivers, look at green hydrogen in a structured manner. That's really an East Malaysia Sarawak initiative and also carbon capture and storage, which is a Petronas oil and gas sector initiative. So it's really drawing together these three sort of main drivers to achieve our 2050 goals and also generate growth for the economy. Okay, um, uh, you've touched on a lot, a lot of points. Let's do a quick recap. Uh, two additional growth drivers looking at hydrogen and carbon capture storage. You're also looking at uh, on the backdrop of us still subsidizing carbon, to be frank, um, which is necessary uh, uh, for now in terms of keeping costs low. But uh, surely uh, this is inconsistent with each other, trying to grow carbon and trying to carbon capture, uh, increase carbon capture storage, but at the same time subsidizing carbon uh, generation itself, i.e. petroleum. How do you think this is going to be harmonized? Yeah, it's a little bit contradictory at this point in time, um, you know, having petrol subsidies, but uh, pushing the sort of the decarbonization agenda at the same time, uh, very clear. But I think, you know, the government does have a plan to deal with that. I think we have talked about subsidy fine tuning. We've seen that in the electricity industry already uh, in terms of, you know, uh, adjusting tariffs in terms of uh, in relation to affordability. So I think in terms of petrol subsidies, we would expect to see something on that next year or as early as, as budget 2024 in October. Uh, but I think the longer term reality is we would have to deal with that petrol subsidy issue because not only is it a huge fiscal burden, it also uh, disincentivizes buying EVs yeah, or going electric because when petrol is cheap, there's a lot more resistance to switching out of ICE cars into EV cars. So if you really want to be uh, an EV manufacturing hub uh, and really transition to EVs, that issue, you're right, Ibrahim, will have to be dealt with. Okay, um, the National Industrial Master Plan that is expected to be announced in a few weeks' time, the NETER or the National Energy Transition Roadmap has to be read together, oh, sorry, a few other uh, roadmaps and plans. Yeah, uh, All this has to be tied in together with the Madani economy uh, that the Prime Minister slash uh, Minister of Finance uh, announced. How do you think all of this is going to come together? Is it gelling together, so to speak, based on your opinion? Yeah, so far, so good is, is how I would put it. I think we are playing to our strengths in the NETR. It's, it's, I mean, we've been in oil and gas, we've been in energy as a nation for 50, dec 50 years, five decades. So we should continue to build on that success. So the green hydrogen, the CCU, uh, carbon capture, utilization and storage, um, the uh, planting up of RE, this all gel with our strengths uh, as a nation. And, you know, the offshoots of that is we will have much more green energy available and much more incentives to green other parts of the economy, like the auto space. So there is, there is uh, you know, sort of spillover there. And I think it also uh, ties into the Madani framework uh, in, in the sense that, you know, two things. One is we are trying to create higher income jobs. I think uh, we all realize salaries in Malaysia are too low and we don't really have a consumer economy. Uh, we don't really have the consumer economy we want because of the suppressed wages. So I'd, more, you know, higher income jobs we can create through these uh, new sort of growth avenues, the better. The second thing is, you know, you know, the way, how do we get Tesla? You know, how do how do we how do we make uh, or Infineon? You know, how do we get these big investments? It's really ease of doing business. So I'm really happy that the Madani framework is focusing on the software of the economy rather than the hardware. You know, frankly, anyone can these days anyone can build a bridge, a road, a building. It's not a competitive advantage for any nation. What is a competitive advantage is ease of doing business. You know, reduced bureaucracy. Uh, institutions which uh, work seamlessly, um, reduce corruption, definitely, which is ex mentioned explicitly in the Madani framework, and a better education system. Those are hard things to do, but those are the focus points of Madani, which I think will make the difference between whether we stay stuck in middle income or able to move on to higher income. 
Speaking of which, the progressive wage model is put into the frame following uh, Rafizi Ramli, the Minister of Economy's, uh, I guess, announcement um, a few weeks ago. Uh, we saw wages stagnating um, quite considerably. 80% of Malaysians are earning either 3,000 or below. 90% um, of Malaysians are earning, no, 97% of Malaysians are earning below 15,000. It's just maddening. Um, do you feel that wage is going to be a key topic of concern for the modern economy? Uh, most definitely. Uh, you know, I think uh, how we go about it uh, remains to be seen in terms of, you know, leveling the playing field between labor and capital. Because obviously at this point in time, it's quite lopsided in favor of capital owners in Malaysia. Yeah, they're, they're, they're making the bulk uh, of the income and labor is losing out. So, you know, how do we do that? I think sort of forcing policies down corporate throats perhaps may be a little bit difficult and you'll see a lot of resistance. It's better, in my view, when you want change, it's always better to incentivize than force. Yeah, so I think the government has to look at more sort of avenues to incentivize corporates to train their workers better, to tie their wages to productivity. Maybe tax breaks uh, on that score as well will help. And of course, give them a lot more uh, sort of um, incentives to automate and create higher paying jobs that way instead of depending on foreign labor. So I think incentivization is the way to go, not so much dictating to companies what they should pay. Okay, um, I don't want to stray away. That's my own mistake because I brought this up myself. Uh, but I don't want to stray away from the National Energy trans uh, trans uh, Transition Roadmap. Um, the taxonomy uh, asserted by uh, Maybank uh, Research Note shows that uh, it subscribes to the climate change and principle-based taxonomy defined by Bank Negara. You argued that uh, the proposal is uh, in accordance with some of the 12th Malaysia Plan themes. Uh, do you feel that such uh, new introductions of tax is going to be anticipated in the upcoming budget announcement that is going to be expected to be done in October this year? Yeah, yeah. are you talking about... Sorry, uh, new taxes? Yes. Yes, new taxes, yeah. or at least some of the taxes that are going to be introduced that has been talked about for quite some time. Uh, will are you ex expecting this to be introduced in this year in uh, 2024 budget? I think there should at least be some preparation to the public that tax changes are in the pipeline. Yeah. So uh, same with the subsidies. Yeah, we may not have a definitive policy in time for October, uh, but definitely we should guide that this is what we're looking to do. Uh, you know scale back subsidies in a staggered manner, you know, how, potentially how the structure may work. And same for taxes. We can't, you know, the fiscal solutions will not just be about subsidy rollback. It will also have to be about tax-based broadening, yeah, because our tax base is far too narrow uh, and it's definitely not healthy, especially when the fiscal situation is under stress. So I would like some preparations on that, some talk around alternative tax measures some talks around a staggered rollback of subsidies, uh, and of course, compensating uh, cash transfer payments to vulnerable groups. These are all sensible things to be to be rolled out uh, in terms of at least voicing it yeah, uh, in the budget to prepare people. Okay, and the final question I want to go through uh, with you before we jump into execution um, is on uh, the uh, main purpose of this whole conversation of having an, an ETR, uh, which is to increase the regeneration, RE generation uh, in the country. Uh, we're looking at RE capacity uh, to be targeted to be increased from 40% in 2035 to 70% by 2050. Um, the argument here is that the government will allow RE development based on a self-contained willing buyer, willing seller model. Uh, this is to encourage more foreign direct investments or DEI into this to diversify the RE programs. And the installation of solar systems in the government buildings will also be scaled up. Up. These are kind of the plans that are in store. Where do you think the risk is going to lie uh, when it comes to this particular whole purpose of trying to boost RE capacity that is contained within this NETR? Yeah, I mean, definitely execution is something we need to monitor. So I think, you know, when you, if you tuned into the Mandadi call with the Ministry of Finance last Friday, you know, the consistent message was we need a report card. We need, you know, you, you announce these measures, but you have to follow up with constant reporting on how the journey is going. Are we meeting the targets? If we are not, why are we behind? Are the investments coming in as planned? If they're not, how do we fix it? So we need a report card for everything. The Madani framework, we need a report card for NETR as well to make sure it, it's being uh, executed uh, appropriately. So all these measures you've just talked about, uh, we need to know, uh, you know whether the policies will be put in place seamlessly. If they're not, what, what's holding it back? Uh, and that will keep us, you know, uh, that will keep the confidence going that this is not just another policy announcement, but something that's really being uh, executed on the ground. But um, 
Yeah, the issue with the NTR, I suppose, is there are many stakeholders here. It's not just a B2B thing or a government to business thing. Now we have households involved as well in terms of leasing out their, their rooftops for, for solar capacity. So there are many, many players. So I think a lot of thought has to go into how, uh, into how to manage the suppliers as well as the demand from businesses for their renewable energy. energy. Anybody familiar with project management knows that there is a need or requirement for a project management office. Uh, we're looking at report cards being tagged to individual parties. Uh, you know, you can't just say something and hopefully something will pick up yeah. or somebody yeah. will pick up. That's why uh, one thing that I find interesting, at least in the NETR, is that the, there is a, a, a task and a champion that is being uh, associated with it. For instance, the energy efficiency in terms of energy switch, and REC was mentioned and MOT was mentioned. And then you move on to other stuff like RE, for instance, Kazana, TNB, uh, Sime Dhabi Prop, for instance. So there are clear stakeholders that are going to be involved. Do you think that this helps in terms of the execution of these plans in order for us to find accountability and then say, hey, you know, you can't run away. I have mentioned you back in day one and you got to cough up with the activity that you've done or not done. At least you're going to be accountable. Do you think that this helps to, along the way in terms of reducing that uh, execution risk? It, it should help is what I would say. I mean, you mentioned the key word, accountability. So all these companies you mentioned and, and organizations you mentioned are champions of various aspects of the NETR. So I guess what we would like to see, um, you know, is um, a regular update on how each component is delivering on their part of the of the pro of the deliverables, uh, basically. So is Tadaga, you know, actually building out those large scale solar farms? You know, are they doing the solar hydro, uh, like like the NETR said? Uh, is Sime Dhabi actually, you know, leasing out those rooftops from their uh, buyers of their properties in Almina? So yes, you know. It's really about accountability, and you can only be accountable when things are transparent and regularly reported. Yeah, so that's what we need. Uh, let's talk about the availability of capital to allow for this transition to take place. Uh, let's not kill ourselves. It costs a lot uh, to uh, change the energy mix of the country to allow for adoption. Yeah, with subsidies and everything else, tax breaks are important, but new capital injection is actually quite needed. In fact, your uh, research report shows that 637 billion ringgit is required to achieve a 70% RE capacity by 2050. Where, where are we going to see where these 600 billion coming from? Is it DDI? Is it FDI? Is it a mixture of government funding? How do you see uh, uh, capital being the growth enabler for this transition? Yeah, I think it's going to be a mix of all that. Uh, definitely, the government will not look to, or be able uh, to fund it by themselves. And if you look at the first catalytic project they announced at the same time as the uh, as the release of the NETR, uh, the, the one in uh, in Johor, uh, you know, it brings in both domestic investors, uh, UEM, uh, as well as foreign investors, uh, you know, uh, things of Chinese party as well as uh, Macquarie uh, Investment Fund as well. So I think that's how we want to move forward. Domestically, we lay out the policy framework. Uh, we, we sort of get the ball rolling with some initial investments and then we get foreigners to come in uh, for the other part of the equation to, to fund the actual investments in the parks. And it, it kind of makes sense because it's a no-brainer that MNCs, uh, Singaporean businesses, they would love to operate, say, in an industrial park, which is 100% RE powered. Yeah, looks fantastic uh, in, your, in the annual reports. It makes you know, a lot of commercial sense as well. Uh, and they would actually like uh, to be sort of part of, uh, I mean, you'll have the RE energy option and you'll have the, the usual, uh, you know, conventional energy option as well. So it gives them more optionality as well in terms of their power sources. So it's, it's really quite a win-win. So we would hope that foreign money sees it that way and they will come into the country to invest accordingly. Okay. Um, final comment before we move on to equities uh, in terms of the NETR, uh, Anand? Yeah, no, I, I'm really looking forward to part two, uh, which I hope, you know, will have that accountability element spelled out as well, because I don't think we saw that in, in part one. I think part one was really laying out the, the priority areas. And, and I really look forward to sort of uh, the less obvious stuff, uh, getting more t uh, time uh, in uh, with media and with investors. Green hydrogen, you know, uh, is, is, a, is a big deal. Uh, Japanese are putting a lot of money behind it. Maybe we can work with them. Uh, and Sarawak is perfectly placed because they have tons of hydropower to create green hydrogen. Uh, so, and uh, you know, they've been involved in the LNG value chain for the longest time. So you just have to build on that. So that's a less obvious one, which I think could be quite big for the country, even in terms of export earnings. Then carbon capture and storage by Petronas. Uh, you know, that's something that's been happening 
I would say under the under the covers, so to speak. We've been so fixated with solar farms. We haven't thought about, hey, maybe we can make money from the carbon capture side as well, because we have been grilling for oil and gas all this time. We have all these huge, you know, wells which are empty because we've drained all the oil or gas. So why don't we just put the carbon back into this oil and oil and just empty wells? You know, it makes complete sense and we can monetize that. Yeah, we can do it not just for our own country, but for other countries as well and seal it up. So you know, these are all different ways of thinking about monetization uh, of the energy industry. And I really like that. So I would like you know, those less obvious sort of drivers to get more airtime with investors. Fantastic. Okay, we'll go for one short break before we continue on a conversation with Anand of Maybank. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me Anand Patmakantan, the Regional Equities Head of Maybank Investment. Earlier on, we were talking about the NETR or the National Energy Transition Roadmap. Um, Anand, I just want to pick your brains in terms of Malaysian equities uh, and, of course, Malaysian economy, the wider uh, outlook of it. Um, we saw uh, the uh, Malaysian equities slump 7% for the first half. Uh, outlook for the second half remains cloudy. Uh, this will air before the elections, so we don't know how the state election is going to impact investor sentiment. Uh, do you feel that uh, investor appetite is actually up for grabs right now? Do you feel that the uh, political risk, so to speak, has been abated? What's the outlook from uh, the House of Maybank when it comes to Malaysian equities? Okay, so, so we did publish our second half outlook strategy uh, in the, on 12 July. And, and I mentioned the date specifically because it was the same day the U.S. CPI data came out, which oh. suddenly, you know, markets were alive again uh, because it sort of heightened the chances of a U.S. soft landing, basically. So very, very opportune. Uh, and July has seen a big re-rating uh, for Malaysia. Well, substantial re-rating for Malaysia. And it was in two halves. Yeah, the first half was because of that CPI data, uh, all, the, all the implications for a weaker U.S. dollar, uh, more attractive uh, sort of... Uh, draw for emerging markets like Malaysia. And we did see foreign inflows actually turn positive in July. That was the first part of the re-rating for the Malaysian market. The second part was more local. And that was the policies we've just been talking about. Yamadani, uh, NETR, you know, investors do like that. There's a, there's a lot more sort of engagement now that you have policies being announced. I think the first half we were a little bit, um, a little bit low on policy announcements. So, you know, this is definitely very welcomed by, by investors. So, Definitely going to August, things have changed quite a bit in terms of momentum uh, for the KLCI, uh, and we hope that continues. Yeah. Uh, stock markets normally take a hit at the moment. Interest rates are on the upswing. Uh, this is largely because investors are thinking about uh, in, you know, putting more in the bond market, for instance, or fixed income. Uh, is that a situation that we're facing right now, particularly when we might see uh, Benagara still raising, or perhaps uh, the house view that Maybank has is that that's it, 3.0, that's the number that they're looking for? Where do you see in terms of the interest rate bearing uh, the, the, the weight on uh, equities right now? Yeah, well, our, our house view is that we don't expect any more OPR right hikes. So 3% is the peak for us. Uh, and this is tied into our view on the Fed uh, funds rate. We do expect it to have already peaked. Uh, so September meeting, we don't expect to change. Now, the jury is still out on that one. But, you know, not 25 basis points or not, the point is we are at the peak of the interest rate cycle globally. And some central banks like Vietnam, China, they're already cutting. Yeah. We don't expect ASEAN to cut this year, but next year we do expect ASEAN to cut in tandem with uh, lower US rates as well. So interest rates no longer that much of a headwind for stocks. Uh, yes, definitely benefited fixed income for a long time, but I think we are at that inflection point where stocks potentially could look forward to some big interest rate cuts next year. And that could be quite stimulative uh, for both economies and stock markets. Do you think investors are reading into the political uh, sphere uh, too deep or they don't really mind what's happening at the state elections? They don't see this as a referendum of sorts against the government, against the unity government? Do you think that that is uh, thinking that they have right now? Yeah, I think they're, they're fairly neutral. I mean, when we talk to our investors, they, they're keeping an eye on it. But, you know, the bottom line is this uh, state elections don't have uh, a direct bearing uh, on the longevity of the federal government. You know, we're, we're confident that they will see through their term, given the current coalition and, and how they are working together. So yes, state elections, uh, there may be some changes in, in seats, 
but we, we don't expect that to sort of uh, disturb uh, the political environment uh, as much as, uh, you know, I guess uh, some news law had it uh, year, a month or two ago. So I think investors are a lot more comfortable now yeah, with the narrative. Final question, Anand, in terms of the ringgit movement, it's uh, it's quite bad. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to book my own vacation. Uh, it's actually, <laughs> I'm actually feeling the pinch. Yeah, so what's your view on ringgit? Yeah, so this year we're thinking 4.5 is where the ringgit will end, uh, which is not very different from where it is now, to be honest. It's about 4.55. But it is substantially better than two months ago when, you know, various uh, observers were saying, you know, five is going to be where the ringgit is. Yeah, going. I know. <laughs> yeah, so things have changed. And this has a lot to do with that, you know, US CPI data on July 12th as well. Uh, it has really taken the sort of the, the heat off the US dollar. You know, the US dollar was the king currency for the last uh, 18 months. But it's starting to weaken, and that's good for all emerging currencies, especially the ringgit. But if you can wait on your holiday, you may want to take it next year, because next year we think ringgit will be at 4.15 to the US dollar. So that's a substantial strengthening. And that's really based on the fact that we don't think Bank Negara will cut interest rates aggressively. Yeah, probably it'll take their time to cut, because we haven't raised interest rates dramatically in the first place. But the yeah. US, we think, will cut rates by about 200 basis points next year. So the gap with the with ringgit rates will narrow and that will be supportive of the ringgit so maybe you want to book next year or travel locally and improve on the uh, you know. this year. there you go so travel locally <laughs> Chuti Chuti Malaysia. Anand, thank you very much it has always been a pleasure uh, speaking to you uh, and of course uh, we should be uh, well uh, are you gonna turn up and vote uh, this weekend well i'm from ipo so i'm not in the picture uh, this time around oh. Ini typical jawapan research analyst ni macam ni. Alright, that was Anand Padmakantan, the Regional Equities Head of Maybank Investment joining us. We've speak, spoken at length about the NETA TR. Uh, do check that out. Of course, we touched a bit on equities. Uh, all these kind of resources can be found on their website as well as on ours at astronomy.com. My name is Ibrahim Sani. Catch you in the next one.